Now the prologue. She was standing in the middle of the railroad tracks. Her head was bowed, and her right front hoof was raised as if she rested. Her reins hung down to the ground, and her saddle had slipped to one side. Behind her, a warehouse filled with medical supplies had just caught fire. Lying beside her there was a dog, with its head between its paws and its ears, erect and listening. Twenty feet away, Robert sat on his haunches, watching them. His pistol hung down from his fingers between his knees. He still wore his uniform with its torn lapels and burned sleeves. In the firelight his eyes were very bright. His lips were slightly parted. He could not breathe through his nose. It was broken. His face and the backs of his hands were streaked with clay and sweat. His hair hung down across his forehead. He was absolutely still. He had wandered now for over a week. Behind him the railroad track stretched back toward the town. In front of him it reached out through the fire toward the open countryside and the road to Magdalen Wood. On one of the sidings was a train. Its engineer and crew had either abandoned it or else they had been killed. It could not be told. Robert appeared to be the sole survivor. He stood up. The engine hissed and rumbled. The train was about a dozen cars, no more. They appeared to be cattle cars. Robert walked to the horse. He had feared she might be lame, but as soon as he approached she put her hoof back down on the cinders and raised her head. Robert petted her, slipping his arm around her neck and drawing the reins back over her ears. She greeted him with a snuffling noise and looked around to watch him as he adjusted her saddle and tightened her cinch. The dog in the meantime had got to his feet and was wagging his tail. It was as if both dog and horse had been waiting for Robert to come for them. The horse was a fine black mare standing about sixteen hands. She had been well cared for up till now, and someone had obviously ridden her every day. She was in superb condition. The dog apparently was used to her company and she to his. They moved in tandem. The dog was also black. One of his ears fell forward in an odd way, giving the appearance of a jaunty cap. Robert didn't know what sort of dog he was, but he was about the size of a Labrador retriever. Before mounting, Robert reached down and rubbed his hand across the dog's back. Then he said, Let's go, and swung into the saddle. They rode down the track toward the road to Magdalen Wood Passing. As they went, the engine on the siding. When they got to the first of the cars, the horse stopped. She threw up her head and whinnied. Other horses answered from inside the car. All right, Robert said, then we shall all go together. Half an hour later the twelve cars stood empty, and Robert was riding along the tracks behind a hundred and thirty horses with the dog trotting beside him. They were on the road to Magdalen Wood by 1 a.m. This was when the moon rose. Red. 1. All of this happened a long time ago, but not so long ago that everyone who played a part in it is dead. Some can still be met in dark old rooms with nurses in attendance. They look at you and rearrange their thoughts. They say, I don't remember. The occupants of memory have to be protected from strangers. Ask what happened, they say, I don't know. Mention Robert Ross, they look away. He's dead, they tell you. This is not news. Tell me about the horses, you ask. Sometimes they weep at this. Other times they say, that bastard... Then the nurses nod at you, much as to say, You see, it's best to go away and find your information somewhere else. In the end, the only fact you have are public. Out of these you make what you can, knowing that one thing leads to another. Sometime someone will forget himself and say too much, or else the corner of a picture will reveal the whole. What you have to accept at the outset is this. Many men have died like Robert Ross, obscured by violence. Lawrence was hurled against a wall. Scott entombed in ice and wind, Mallory blasted on the face of Everest, lost. We're told Euripides was killed by dogs, and this is all we know. The flesh was torn and scattered, eaten. Ross was consumed by fire. These are like statements, pay attention. People can only be found in what they do. 2. You begin at the archives with photographs, Robert and Rowena, rabbits, wheelchairs, children, dogs and horses. Barbara Dorsey, the S.S. Masanabe, Magdalen Wood, boxes and boxes of snapshots and portraits, maps and letters, cablegrams and clippings from the papers. All you have to do is sign them out and carry them across the room. Spread over tabletops, a whole age lies in fragments underneath the lamps. The war to end all wars. 
All you can hear is the wristwatch on your arm. Outside it snows. The dark comes early. The archivist is gazing from her desk. She coughs. The box is smell of yellow dust. You hold your breath. As the past moves under your fingertips, part of it crumbles. Other parts you know you'll never find. This is what you have. 3. 1915 The year itself looks sepia and soiled, muddied like its pictures. In the snapshots everyone at first seems timid, lost, irresolute. Boys and men stand squinting at the camera. Women turn away, suspicious. They still maintain a public reticence. Part of what you see you recognize. Here for the first time the old Edwardian elegance falters. Style is neither this nor that, unless you could say it was apologetic. The men wear caps and shapeless overcoats to work, jamming their hands deep into pockets. Imitation uniforms spring up everywhere. Girls wear middies, boys are dressed in sailor suits. Women wore a sort of great coat and flat-brimmed hats with rosette badges. Ladies no longer wear their furs. They drape them from their arms like all the foxtail trophies hanging down like scalps. No one smiles. Life is dangerous. Summer induces the parasol, winter the galosh. Some of the photographs are blurred. Even though the figures freeze, the dark machines that fill the roads move on. Here's the boys' brigade with band. Backyard minstrels got up in cork, bang their tambourines, and strut across a lawn on Admiral Road. Every parlor has its piano. Here are soldiers arm in arm singing, Keep your head down, Fritzy boy. Tea dance partners do the castle walk to orchestras of brass cornets and silver saxophones. Violins have been retired. This is the age of motorized portation. Over one thousand makes a motor car can be had. Backyard blacksmiths build them to custom. Ask the man who owns one. Here are families sitting overdressed in packards, posed aloof from the backs of Chevrolets and Russell Knights. Everyone, it seems, is journeying around the block. Children vie to blow the horns. Then something happens. April, Ypres. Six thousand dead and wounded. The war that was meant to end by Christmas might not end till summer, maybe even fall. This is where the pictures alter, fill up with soldiers, horses, wagons. Everyone is waving either at the soldiers or the cameras. More and more people want to be seen. More and more people want to be remembered. Hundreds, thousands crowded to the frame. Here come the troops down Young Street. Women abandon all their former reticence and rush out into the roadway, throwing flowers and waving flags. Here come the 48th Highlanders, kilts and drums and leopard skins. Boys race after them on bikes. Little girls, whose mouths hang open, hardly dare to follow. Older men remove their hats. There is Sir Sam Hughes standing on the dais, taking the farewell salute. God save the King, a banner. Everywhere you look, trains are pulling out of stations, ships are sailing out of ports, music drowns the long hurrah. Everyone is focused now, shading their eyes against the sun. Everyone is watching with an outstretched arm. Silence at the edge of wharves and time. Robert Ross comes riding straight toward the camera. His hat has fallen off. His hands are knotted to the reins. They bleed. The horse is black and wet and falling. Robert's lips are parted. He leans along the horse's neck. His eyes are blank. There's mud on his cheeks and forehead, and his uniform is burning. Long, bright tails of flame are streaming up behind him. He leaps through memory without a sound. The archivist sighs. Her eyes are lowered above some book. There's a strand of hair in her mouth. She brushes it aside and turns the page. You lay the fiery image back in your mind and let it rest. You know it will obtrude again and again until you find its meaning. Here. A band is assembled at the band shell, red coats and white gloves. They serenade the crowd with soldiers of the queen. You turn them over, wondering if they'll spill, and you read on the back in the faintest ink in a feminine hand, Robert. But where? You look again, and all you see is the crowd, and the band is still playing, quite undisturbed and far from spilled. Then you see him, Robert Ross standing on the sidelines with pocketed hands, feet apart and narrowed eyes. His hair falls sideways across his forehead. He wears a checkered cap and dark blue suit. He watches with a dubious expression, half admiring, half reluctant to admire. He's old enough to go to war. He hasn't gone. He doubts the validity in all this marshalling of men, but the doubt is inarticulate. It stammers in his brain. He puts his hand out sideways, turns. He reaches for the wicker back of a wheelchair. Come on, Rowena, there's still the rest of the park to sit in. 
Thomas Ross and family stand beside a new Ford truck. The new Ford truck is parked before the gates of Raymond Ross Industries, where farm machinery is made. This picture will appear in the Toronto Mail and Empire with a banner headline stating that the truck is being turned over to the Raymond Ross Field Surgery Hospital behind the lines in France. Large red crosses adorn its sides. The family consists of Mr. and Mrs. Ross and three of their children, Robert, Peggy, and Stuart. Rowena, the eldest, is not shown. She is never in photographs that are apt to be seen by the public. In fact, she is not much admitted into the presence of a camera. Robert has her picture on his bureau. Rowena is seated in her scallop wicker chair with the high double wheels. She wears a white dress. Her hair is curly and short. Her shoulders are perpetually hunched. Her head is large and adult, but her body is that of a ten-year-old child. She is twenty-five years old. She is what is called hydrocephalic, which in plain language means she was born with water in the brain. Her expression is lovely and pensive. She wears a wide and colorful sash. In her lap she holds a large white rabbit. Robert told her once she was the first human being he remembered seeing. He was lying in his crib, and waking from a nap through half-closed eyes, he saw his sister gliding in her chair across the room and coming to rest beside him. She stared at him for a long, long time, and he stared back. When she smiled, he thought she was his mother. Later, when he came to realize she couldn't walk and never left the chair, he became her guardian. It was for her he learned to run. Mother and Miss Davenport, wearing the canteen aprons, stand on the platform at Sunnyside Station handing out chocolate bars to the soldiers who are leaning out of trains. They do this every Thursday afternoon. Robert wishes his mother wouldn't do such things, because he's shy and thinks she appears too much in public. But Mrs. Ross is adamant. Such things have to be done. Someone has to do them. The leaders of society are duty-bound, and what would people say? So on and so on. All the while, Miss Davenport is nodding and smiling, agreeing with every word. But not one word of it is true. Mrs. Ross performs her duties Thursday afternoons because of dreams. Here is Meg, a patriotic pony, draped in bunting, standing in a garden. Her ears lie flat. She is either angry or frightened. Meg is very old. Just at the edge of the picture, Stuart can be seen squinting at the sun. He wears an Indian headdress, and he holds a baseball bat. This is Peggy Ross with Clinton Brown from Harvard. Nothing in Clinton Brown from Harvard's appearance warrants three exclamation points. He was only one of Peggy's many bow. Robert is in this picture, too, seated on the steps of the South Drive house, along with a girl called Heather Lawson. Robert was supposed to be interested in Heather Lawson, but the fact was it was she who was interested in him. Not that Robert didn't like her, only that he wasn't interested. Interested led to marriage, and this is what Heather Lawson wanted. So did her parents. Robert was a fine catch for any girl. He was a scholar and an athlete. Besides, he had money. One summer the Rosses crossed to England on the SS Minnetonka in order to spend a holiday with a Raymond Ross British representative, whose name was Mr. Hawkins. All through the month of June they languished on the beaches of the Isle of Wight. In late July they came home on the Minnetonka's sister ship, the SS Minnewanka. From the decks of the ship, early one morning, one of the Rosses, it was not clear which, took a photograph of the ocean. Whoever it was later drew an arrow, pointing to a small white dot on the far horizon. The small white dot can barely be seen. Nothing else is visible but sea and sky. Just above the arrow, written in bold black ink, is the question, What is this? All too clearly the small white dot is an iceberg. Why whoever took the picture failed to verify this fact remains a mystery. The thing is dated August 4th, but no year is given. Shuffle these cards and lay them out. This is the hand that Robert Ross was born with. Mr. and Mrs. Ross, Peggy and Stuart, Rabbits and Rowena, also a dog named Bimbo, and a clipping from the paper reading, Longboat Wins the Marathon. Meg and Miss Davenport, Heather Lawson and the Iceberg, and Clinton Brown from Harvard, who died a hero's death at the Battle for Bellow Wood in June 1918, worthy of an exclamation point at last. This is perhaps a good place to introduce Miss Turner, whose importance lies at the end of this story, but whose insights throw some light on its beginnings. Marion Turner was a nurse in the Great World War, and she remembers Robert vividly. It was she who received him and cared for him after he'd been arrested and brought into the hospital at Boydell Madeleine. She is given, on tape, the only first-hand account of him we have, aside from that of Lady Julia Dorsey. Here's part of what Miss Turner has to say. 
She's over eighty now, but still robust, and she speaks with a good deal of energy, sprinkling her conversation with laughter and offerings of sherry and a wide green apartment overlooking a park. Transcript, Marion Turner, 1. You'll understand from what took place why I cannot tell you what he looked like. I suppose such things are of interest. Well, of course they are. Laughter. Everyone wants to know what people look like. Somehow it seems to say so much about a person's possibilities. Do you know what I mean? What I can say is that Lady Barbara Dorsey was in love with him, and that all her other men were smashing. So I dare say Ross was, too. Anyway, because of what happened, I can't remark about the face. But my impression was of someone extremely well-made who cared about his body. At least that's my memory of it, the way it was. You get them all mixed up after so long a time, and every boy they brought to us seemed such a handsome lad. You never hear that any more. He was such a handsome lad. But we were always saying so in all the letters we wrote to their families. I guess you saw them all as beautiful because you couldn't bear to see them broken. The human body, well, it's like the mind, I guess, terribly impressive till you put it in jeopardy. Then it becomes such a delicate thing, like glass. Robert Ross? Well, it was just so tragic. When you think that nowadays so many people, young people especially, might have known what he was all about. But then... My opinion was, he was a hero. Not your everyday Sergeant York or Billy Bishop, mind you, laughter, but a hero nonetheless. You see, he did the thing no one else would even dare to think of doing. And that, to me, is as good a definition of a hero as you'll get. And when the thing is done as something of which you disapprove, he was an homme unique. That's much more of a compliment in French than it is in English. Oh, he was fire, you know. There's nothing worse than fire even after all I've seen. And the story of the horses is something I'd rather never have known had happened. Oh, I quite understand why you feel it must be told, but... And Miss Turner turned to look out the window at this point. There's quite a long pause on the tape. Well, it was the war that was crazy, I guess. Not Robert Ross or what he did. You'll say that's trite, of course. But is it? Looking back, I hardly believe what happened. That the people in that park are there because we all went mad. Yes, he was unique, but you have to be careful searching his story out. I've been through it all, you know. Laughter. The whole of this extraordinary century, and it's not the extraordinary people who've prevailed upon its madness, quite the opposite. Oh, far from it. It's the ordinary men and women who've made us what we are. Monstrous, complacent, and mad. Remember that. Even if I do sound a moralizing fool, I'll risk it. After all, I'm pretty old. More laughter. I could be gone tomorrow. There may not be anyone else who'll say this to you. Everyone's so sophisticated these days they can't stand the hot lights. Eh, hey, well, I saw both wars, and I'm here to tell you the passions involved were as ordinary as me and my sister Bessie fighting over who's going to cook the dinner. And who won't? Laughter. These people in the park, you, me, everyone, the greatest mistake we made was to imagine something magical separated us from Lutendorf and Kitchener and Foch. Our leaders, you see, well... Churchill and Hitler, for that matter, laughter. Why, such men are just the butcher and the grocer, selling us meat and potatoes across the counter. That's what binds us together. They appeal to our basest instincts, the lowest common denominator. And then we turn around and call them extraordinary. Here she tapped the table, rattling the sherry glasses. See what I mean? You have to be awfully careful how you define the extraordinary, especially nowadays. Robert Ross was no Hitler, and that was his problem. 4. Easter was early in 1915. Good Friday fell on April 2nd. It snowed. Robert got off a train that morning in Kingston, Ontario. He carried a brand new suitcase and wore his checkered cap. His raincoat, also new, was of a style that soon would be known as the trench coat. Its buttons were made of crisscrossed strips of leather, and its salient feature was that it was short, short enough for you to wade in water up to your knees. Robert stood alone to one side, watching the engine from under the eaves of the station. He was watching the stoker feed the flames with rattling shovelfuls of coal. He watched with his hands in his pockets, shoulders hunched, and his toes pressed hard against his suitcase. At school he'd been taught that hunching the shoulders was an ungallant posture. Still he maintained it while the engine bellowed and hissed. Great clouds of steam billowed out around its wheels. The fire horse, that's what the Indians call it. Robert looked to one side from under the peak of his cap, hoping that no one had seen him flinch from the steam or stepping back from the fire. He was wishing they would leave. His shoulders hurt, his arm was sore, 
There were bruises on his back. He ached. He wanted all the others who'd got off the train to depart the station before him. There must have been three dozen, forty or fifty men, all coming down from Toronto together, joining others from as far away as Winnipeg and Saskatoon. Most of them had swaggered up and down the cars like braggarts, smoking cigarettes and drinking out of silver flasks. Robert avoided them all through the journey, wanting to protect the last of his privacy. Now they were drifting away in groups of three and four, joshing and pushing one another, calling out names and throwing snowballs, singing songs. Robert looked the other way down the platform where he saw three women. Two of them were young and smiling. The other was older and wore a nurse's uniform and cape. The younger ones were dressed in neat blue coats, and one of them was watching him. Robert turned away, annoyed and confused. He was shy of girls just now, distrusting them, and wondering why they had to look at you and make you think you wanted them. Only a few weeks ago he'd discovered he was not in love with Heather Lawson. Heather had behaved so inexplicably. What did women mean to do with the men? At a party in his own house, he told him that someone else was in love with her. Robert was not disturbed by this at all. What had someone else's being in love with her to do with him? But Heather Lawson wanted him to be disturbed. All right, Robert said. Who is it? Maybe then I'll be disturbed. He smiled. It's Tom Bryant, Heather said, and I think you ought to fight him. Robert didn't understand. Bryant? Who was he? Did Heather Lawson love him? No, she said. Of course not. Then why should I fight him? Robert asked. Because he loves me, she said. She spoke as if Robert were stupid. It all made perfect sense to Heather, but Robert thought it was idiotic and said so. Heather wailed out loud at that, wailed and railed and paled, and fainted. In short, she made a scene of the sort then popular in the books of Booth Tarkington. All the guests at Robert's party left. There were even social complications for his parents in the aftermath, and Heather said she never, never, never wanted Robert in her sight again, all because he wouldn't fight a man she didn't love and whom he'd never seen. The matron snapped her fingers, and the final cab was hailed. After their luggage had been lashed to the roof, the two young women made for the open door. One, not looking back, got in beside the matron, but the other, uh, just for an instant, turned and looked in Robert's direction. He was handsome, no question, even though his ears stuck out a bit too far, and his jaw was unfashionably wide in the age of pointed features. Something in the way he stood alone appealed to her. But the matron's hand reached out, and the girl was snapped inside like a folded doll, and the cab was driven away. Looking back... Her expression said goodbye, and she was gone. Twenty minutes later, Robert still stood there with his suitcase, immobile. He stood so resolutely still, the station master came and asked him if he'd missed the train. Robert said no, that he was fine, and if there was another cab, he'd hire it. But the station master said there were no more cabs. Just the standard quota, and these days that was never enough, what with everyone coming and going all hours of every day and any day. The week had no more meaning. Even holy days of abstinence and sober significance, like Sundays and Easter, the trains came and went, and the people got on and off, laughing just as if the world wasn't going to end. I suppose you come down here like all them others to join with the field artillery, huh? he asked. Yes, said Robert. Well, I wish you luck, young man. The way they pile them in and out of here seems to me like they're looking for a long, long wars. Yes, I guess they are, said Robert. The stationmaster went about his business, slowly making his retreat into the warmth of the telegraph office, and Robert could see him talking to the key operator, chucking his thumb in Robert's direction, probably saying, There's a queer young lad out there who doesn't seem to want to leave. Robert picked up his suitcase and turned away toward the station yard. His shoulders ached. The bruises bore the brunt of the shift in weight every time he moved his arms. The yard was wide and wet. An old white dog was walking across the cinders toward the gate. Robert had stood so long, the snow had turned to rain. Off in the town, the Easter passing bells began to toll, and Robert looked at his Oxford boots and gauged the width and depth of the nearest puddle brimming off the edge of the platform. Staring down expressionless, he watched as his reflection was beaten into submission by the rain. He turned his collar up and pulled the peak of his cap right down to the bridge of his nose. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath. The melting snow began to turn to mist, and the mist was filled with rabbits and Rowena and his father and his mother and the whole of his past life, birth and death and childhood. He could breathe them in and breathe them out. Right to the very last second, hearing an approaching train that might have taken him home, he didn't know in which direction he would go, down into the puddle and up to the town or back along the platform. The dog beyond the gate, bedraggled and lost, sat down to watch him. 
maybe some decision of its own depended on which way Robert went. Then Robert closed his eyes and made his choice. He stepped down into the puddle and stood there. How could he move? Rowena had been buried the day before.